Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you for um, coming out on a snowy day or, or listening in on the computer or wherever you are um, out there. Hopefully I can manipulate this technology all right. Um, so what I'm going to be presenting today are some preliminary thoughts about the uh, ethnographic fieldwork that I conducted for my dissertation in anthropology. Uh, with the time we have, what I'd like to do is run a little bit through um, LGBTQ aging in context of care, then go in to describe some of the ethnographic fieldwork that I conducted in Toronto, mainly in 2016 and 2017. And then the bulk of the discussion I'd like to offer are two invitations. So first is to think about aging with disability, and second is to think about gender and aging beyond the binary. So LGBTQ aging in context of care. So who has seen some headlines like this? We have Canadian seniors now outnumber children for first time 2016 census shows. Canada's aging population and implications for government finances, and Canada woefully unprepared to deal with senior population surge, Senate committee hears. So that Canada's population is aging is by now a common refrain in gerontological literature and popular media, as these examples show. Media coverage takes different angles and tones, from concern over how much it will cost, to language of woe and worry, to more measured headlines that nonetheless point to an aging population as a new frontier and as a problem to develop solutions around. LGBTQ seniors have also made the headlines as part of this coverage. Articles that are popular and academic foreground the issue of potentially having to go back into the closet in long-term care homes or in accessing home care and other health services. So as evidenced in, in um, this headline here, LGBT seniors afraid they will have to go back in the closet. Others take a different angle, focusing on stories of people who come out later in life. So this article, uh, A Gay Old Time, for example, um, shares the story of one man who came out as gay as a story of embracing one's true self, while internationally stories of older people who transition later in life have also been picked up by news outlets in the last couple of years. The government of Canada is also taking note, for instance, in the special report on the social isolation of seniors with a focus on LGBTQ seniors. Advocacy organizations um, driven and composed of queer and trans people themselves have also started to identify LGBT seniors as a group to advocate for. So this image here is taken from a GAL Human Rights Trust website and the Senior, uh, Senior Pride Network is a grassroots group in Toronto composed of seniors and service providers, which is also quite active. So my dissertation, dissertation research has explored the experiences of aging and care of LGBTQ people in Toronto. So I'm particularly interested in, how, in understanding how interdependent social relations and institutions shape people's experiences of aging and care and possibilities to imagine forms of care in other ways. Um, and I'm just going to stop for a second. My apologies to people in the room. It's a funny kind of triangulation between you and, and the, the screen and, and this microphone. So if I'm looking down a lot, um, my apologies for that. So um, my key questions include, how is responsibility for care being negotiated amongst different networks and sources of support? How do norms of gender and ability affect people's experiences of care in later life? And how can people's circumstances be understood along a longer life course trajectory and within the current political and economic moment in Canada? Oh, here we go. Is it echoing? Yeah? Okay. Oh. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Does that work? Okay. Okay. So it doesn't echo too much. Thank you. Great. <laughs> So I recently completed 18 months of ethnographic fieldwork for this project. Over this time, I conducted partic participant observation with nine key interlocutors living in long-term care homes and to receive care and support in the community and conducted two additional sets of interviews. Um, so first, what is participant observation? So participant observation is a method by which anthropologists and others spend time in a community or amongst people they study and, as the word suggests, participate and observe. In one author's words, it's like a deep hanging out. In my fieldwork, that meant spending time with key interlocutors. I had coffee with them in their living rooms, 
went along on wheel-trans rides to medical appointments, met with their home care providers, sat with them during mealtimes, and watched a lot of CP24 while eating illicit popcorn. These were people who self-identified as LGBTQ, were in their early 60s to early 80s, and most people had multiple chronic health conditions, including ALS, Parkinson's disease, and dementia, and were living with physical and cognitive disabilities. While some people had family or friends, um, close friends nearby, many people did not, and most were living, if not below the poverty line, on quite limited incomes. In addition to spending time with these uh, key individuals, I also conducted interviews with two sets of people. So one set were interviews with over 50 LGBTQ older adults residing in the Toronto area in the community about their perspectives and experiences of aging and receiving care. The second set were interviews with over 70 surrounding actors involved in the care of key interlocutors engaged with aging and queer and trans issues in Toronto. These surrounding actors included friends, volunteers, frontline and administrative long-term care home staff, and other community-based service providers and advocates, including social workers, lawyers, and community activists. As with all ethnographic studies, my aim was to gain an understanding of other people's life worlds and to analyze the social conditions in which differently positioned people live. Um, my analysis thus departs from the lived ex everyday experiences and concerns of my research interlocutors. As an anthropologist, I believe that through focusing on the mundane and ordinary, uh, yet ever important as it is what makes up our days, um, details of everyday lives and interactions, we can shed light on broader social and economic situations and transformations. Oh. There we go. Um, so it was also, as I said, to understand how people's circumstances can be understood a longer, along a longer life course trajectory as well as in the current political and economic moment. So of course, every individual has their own unique experiences of life and there's no authoritative version of history, um, but the time over which people over 60 have lived is one of significant social change. Um, this has included the emergence of civil and gay rights movement, the decriminalization of homosexuality, and changes in social and legal recognitions available to LGBTQ people and their families. Um, so just for, for listeners who may be less familiar to get us all on a similar page are just a few very select um, dates or, or a timeline of, of what has happened over these few decades. Um, so as you can see here, for example, um, homosexuality was decriminalized in 1969 and removed as a mental disorder from the DSM in 1973. Um, in 1981, more than 300 men were arrested following following police raids at four gay bathhouses in Toronto. Um, so this is considered to be kind of Canada's stonewall moment. And 1980s and 90s was the height of the AIDS epidemic in North America. Um, if we're looking at an Ontario context, 1995 was the year uh, the province made it legal for same-sex couples to adopt. And in 2005, Canada became the fourth country to officially sanction gay marriage nationwide. 2017, so moving a bit closer to the present moment, uh, Bill C-16 was passed, adding gender identity and expression as prohibited grounds for discrimination under Canadian law. We also have emerging concerns about Canada's aging population and questions about long-term care and home care delivery. So how will we support older adults and their families? And emerging organizing around um, LGBTQ and Two-Spirit seniors issues. So where does this leave people who are aging today? So for the remainder of the presentation, I'd like to offer two invitations. So one is to think about aging and disability together, and two, to think about aging and gender beyond a binary. And as a way in, I want to tell two stories derived from FERC. So these are composites of people and circumstances I encountered in the field. The names are pseudonyms, and the details have also been changed to ensure confidentiality. Um, so this slide is blank, so you can simply listen. So the first, um, Bob. I got in touch with Bob for another research participant, a friend of his who suggested he might be interested in speaking with me. I buzzed up to Bob's apartment and walked in as instructed, calling hello and following the voice that called back from the far end of the apartment, past the living area. It's a subsidized apartment downtown, and among other units, this one is handicap equipped. 
Passing over the floor, I enter a room with a faint air of cigarette smoke, Bob's one vice, he tells me, a large TV, a walker with rainbow paraphernalia, a cat, pill containers, and the evidence of breakfast among that which is between us as I settle myself into a chair. Bob speaks to me from his bed, describing to me the roster of people who come in to help him with housework, dishes, bathing, arranged by a local organization, how each has their specified task, how no one will be like the first one, and people can be rude or nice enough, and he has little control. It's all a facade, Celeste, he says, and he's been close to death many times, and when it comes down to it, it is just him, alone. He tells me about his friends, who are good ones, and the disintegration of a long-standing group because they're no longer allowed to smoke on the patio outside. The little things that make all difference, I think. Uncle M on the phone, and Bob's feeling that he must know that he's gay and supportive in his, in his own way. They speak a couple of times a year. The brother who stays mum, the sister he hasn't seen in 40 years. These are the figures he conjures up for me as I sit, amongst the other things that populate his room. Bob speaks of his frustrations and his gratitude for the helpers, for his friends, and for the good luck of long-term disability. Uh, he became ill shortly after transition from a temporary to a full-time position at a large company, meaning that along with his pension contributions he made as a lifelong worker and the old age pension, um, he is hovering around the poverty line. For my presence, gratitude is something that he has learned and that he voices as sincere and that it arouses in me both a, a mix of admiration and discomfort. What good luck, I think, the timing and nature of illness. So there are many ways we can interpret Bob's situation and to portray what was going on around him. With an aim of thinking aging with disability, I'd like to offer three angles of analysis. Um, so, so given the length of the presentation, these are more kind of brief hints towards future directions for us to discuss or, or you to think further about, and I'm happy to expand more, um, expand more during our discussion or Q&A time. So first is the question of access to resources. So there's a mixture of supports that Bob relies on. First, as he ages in his home with the intermittent company of friends, there are workers assigned to perform specific duties, so namely of nursing and house, household upkeep. So this is a mix of formalized service provision and more informal networks of care, which have formed around him and which he relies upon, with the mix of gratitude and frustration that he described to me. Second is his housing situation, his ability to age in place or in his own home and community, uh, which is made possible by housing subsidies. So he lives in a rent geared to income unit, which he would not otherwise be able to afford. Moreover, he moved a number of years ago to a specially equipped unit that is wheelchair accessible if need be. Um, finally, supports that he receives and his financial viability are tied to the timing and nature um, of his condition. So he has certain local supports by virtue of as someone living and aging with HIV, and because he was a full-time permanent employee at the time of becoming ill, he is entitled to long-term disability. So someone with a different condition who had not worked regularly their entire lives as Bob did, and therefore have a less healthy CPP entitlement, and or who had not had a full-time job at the time of the onset of their illness would be considerably worse off, all else equal. Um, so while Bob's situation appears to reveal an exacerbated dependency, given that he requires help for most activities of daily living, it also surfaces him as a recognizable subject deemed worthy of support extended by the state, his local community, and previous private employer. So second, we can think about social belonging and, and connection. So at the same time, this is a vexed recognition. As a subcare and as a person aging with disability, there are also limits to social belonging that he experiences. Um, first, there are those that as a gay man, Bob has experienced over a lifetime as his sexuality was criminalized and has he also lost many friends in his age cohort to AIDS. Second, at the time that I met him, Bob could not access many public social spaces. He used a walker, and while he could go out of the building on the elevator and to the patio outside, um, sorry, beyond that, he had to navigate inaccessible environments as, for example, cafe entrances with stairs, which are no small thing. Finally, the long-standing group of cigarette-smoking friends he described to me also disintegrated following an ordinance that they could no longer smoke by the building. So somewhat paradoxically, efforts to promote his health and also those of others in a different way uh, compromised his healthy social life. 
And lastly is to think about impairment, debility, and disability. So as we can see, there are many layers of social relations shaping Bob's current situation, at the same time constituting, encompassing, and defining what matters about the physical impairments and multiple chronic health conditions that Bob lives with. Following the onset of disease, his status as a person with a disability has afforded him access to certain resources. At the same time, as over his life, there are social conditions that impede his access to spaces and ways of being um, that are debilitating. So I'd now like to turn to the second focus, which is gender and aging beyond the binary. I particularly like to think um, a post a challenge in three key areas. So one is thinking about gender roles in aging. Two is to think about social change and trans aging and gender expression and how this is something in flux that can be both enabled and constrained in situations of aging and intense intensive care. So Stella. Stella is a 70-something trans woman who resides in a publicly subsidized long-term care home. She was admitted here some years ago following a steady decline in her physical mobility. Stella Ryan Witte earned an undergraduate degree and worked as a teacher for some years before she was encouraged by her school board to retire. She doesn't speak much about this period of her life but has alluded to a diagnosis of mental illness that prompted her effective dismissal. While she found ways to express her gender over life, she effectively came out as transgender later in life, in her late 50s. Her primary source of support currently comes from a local acquaintance who is also her power of attorney. This person is the tireless source of support and advocates for Stella as a trans woman, as well as taking care of details such as banking, buying and bringing in new glasses and clothes, and organizing activities at the home for Stella to participate in. Stella was originally admitted into another long-term care home into a standard shared room, but was transferred into a single room as a solution to the distress her, present ca her presence caused to her roommate's family. While Stella is spoken of fondly by staff and residents in the long-term care home and participates in social activities, some residents are also hostile towards her, as she can also be hostile towards others. Some days, Stella dons her desired markers of femininity. Other days, she does not. While people familiar with her, such as long-term care home staff, address her with the pronoun she, others' pronoun you shifted in the time I spent with her as she moved through various healthcare sites and also interacted with people coming and going in the home. Stella's ability to express her gender was also shaped in part by her reliance upon staff to assist her with such tasks as getting dressed in the morning. So Stella's story surfaces for us some of the challenges of aging as a gender non-conforming person and of residing in an institution. It also surfaces several points of tension and inclusion in existing anthropological literature on gender and aging and suggests possible avenues for further thought about gender and aging across disciplines. So again, I'd just like to offer a few directions here as food for thought and further discussion. So first um, is to think about conceptualizations of gender and aging in gerontological and some anthropo anthropological literatures that often consider how men's and women's roles change throughout the life course. Scholars have traced, for example, how women's gendered roles shift through courses of adolescence, marriage, motherhood, and becoming widows, and how ideals of masculinity may become troublesome for men with changes in physical appearance, ability, and opportunities to work and earn livings. These are not universals, of course, as we each chart our own courses and norms and ideals of gender and aging vary across cultures. Not every woman is a grandmother, for example, and not everywhere is an older woman expected to be one. The angle I'd like to press, however, is to consider how people who have not conformed to normative or expected gender roles over a life course um, become situated in older age and what this may mean both for how they can inhabit existing gender roles in later life and the emerging possibilities for what it can mean to age well. So again, for Stella, for example, given the pathologization of trans people and constraints on trans and queer people forming families, becoming a grandmother, if she had wanted to be one, would have been more challenging for her than for a cisgender heterosexual person. Um, it could also be the case that she never wanted to be one. So we also have to consider the possibilities for gender expression beyond normative social roles and particularly in situations of care, how to support these. 
So this rec uh, resonates with the second point regarding social change and trans aging. So as trans people age and as people transition later in life, there is also an emerging arena of, of scholarly conversation as, as these things tend to, tend to occur. So to date, mu much of this research has focused on the potential barriers that older trans people may face in accessing care and discrimination they may encounter. The situation with Stella and where to place her in a care home, so with a man, with a woman, by herself, um, as a problem, speaks to the current institutional incapacity to treat older trans people with dignity and respect in a manner that should be expected. While people continue to chart new paths in life, and as changes are made at such levels as the Can Canada Human Rights Act, we can also think about ongoing social change and how to enable people to age, and indeed simply to live, in ways that they desire through structural reforms and in everyday ethical actions. So finally, um, is to consider gender expression in flux. So most popular media coverage and academic work depicts transitioning as a completed shift from one gender to another. So for example, as male to female or female to male in the literature. In many people's lived experiences, feelings about uh, gender and desire for gender expression are not so black and white or binary. Non-binary and genderqueer are words that people use to describe a sense of self that need not be defined as a man or a woman. Some people use the pronoun they. How a person wishes to pre present themselves on a given day or social occasion may also change or be in flex. In situations of care where a person requires aid with activities of daily living, um, it is thus imperative that such expressions be supported. So as much of the literature has focused on, this means providing training to staff, people, and others. Um, and also, I think, to, to have the number of staff, people, and resources to give people the time to do their work in the first place, for example, of, of getting somebody dressed in the morning. So this is to say that as we're thinking about an aging population and aging well for different minority populations, those charged with caring um, must also be, in turn, enabled to support those that they care for. And these images here, so the top one, I don't know if anyone's familiar with, there was a book that came out recently that was put together by a photographer and a social work professor. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the, those images at the top are by Jess T. Uh, Duggan there. And the image at the bottom is from a gal Canada and the other one is um, Michelle Dewberry. You know what? I think the, the name is escaping me at the moment, but I can, I can let you know. Um, so by way of a concluding remark before we launch into some discussion, um, I'd like to turn your attention to this graphic made by the Senior Pride Network. So as academics, policymakers, healthcare professionals, loved ones and others, consider what is and could what it could be to be aging. Um, I think it's, it's paramount to listen carefully to the perspectives and desires of those we aspire to care for. So this graphic points us to the diversity that also exists within LGBT communities and to bear in mind the strength um, that seniors have, strengths which do not foreclose the need for structural changes. So that was what I'd like to share today and to leave ample time to um, elaborate further if you have questions or discuss together. Thank you. And should I do anything with the this or just leave it? OK, OK, great. Yes, so so specifically thinking about aging and disability at the same time, um, which I think they're often cordoned off, at least in, in much of the anthropological literature. These are kind of separate discussions, separate conversations that are happening. And second, to think about gender and aging beyond a binary, because I think many existing analyses that I'm familiar with kind of trace, OK, this is how a woman's social role changes. This is how a man's social role changes. Um, and the complex, complexities within that, but there is kind of an assumption that through the life course, one kind of progresses in, in a given gender in a normative way or a non-normative way, but without such significant uh, change. So. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I think it's definitely a class issue and it's definitely a question of the resources you have at hand, be those financial resources to buy what you want to buy to, to dress with or also the people you have at hand to go out and, and do that. Exactly. Um, and I think it's also, you know, you can think about what are considered the basics, right? If we support people at a, at a level referential to a minimum in terms of activities of daily living or these are the set basic things that need to do, who determines what those are. So for the example with the cigarettes, right, there's a lot of um, writing about concern about people who who smoke. Um, and this is kind of a morally detrimental thing. Um, but, you know, this this person who I was speaking to, he told me he was like, you know, Celeste, after 65, we should be able to smoke as much as we want. Right. And this was his and 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 in the way that, you know, the the more public health concern about this would be lung cancer, et cetera, et cetera. But, but not being able to smoke aside meant that he lost a gigantic source of social life, right? So again, it's, it's who determines the, the terms in which people can live, and especially when someone is the subject of care, right? So they're again and again seen, yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure. Yes. Yes. Sure. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. What emerged? Sure. So, um, for for the key interlocutors, the the kind of inclusion criteria was receiving intensive levels of care on a daily or weekly basis. So secondarily that, you know, that means multiple chronic health conditions, you know, physical and cognitive disabilities. Um, but because I started with a question not from a, a medical category, so for example, tracing dementia or tracing Parkinson's, but from the kind of situation of care, that's how it um, came about. Yeah. And of course, it's possible that there, you might Definitely, yeah. 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 Um, I, 
I'm, I'm yeah. just this hypothetical. I'm just using the hypothesis. I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert. I totally. But I do know that in some of my research, we particularly focus on data such as health, okay. like broadly, mm -hmm. um, that uh, education is a huge factor, even in young people. Yeah. And it's so multi-layered, right? Because on the one level, we have, okay, we have access to built environments, right? Which a lot of disability scholars, this is this is where the work pays attention to. We then have living in a long-term care home, which, you know, in a lot of ways, there are volunteers who go in, there are family members, but there is a way in which there's this sliding door, right? And it is on one side of the door and the other side of the door, and there's people who live in institutions, and it is quite... I would say segregated, right? So there is an isolation because we segregate people with certain conditions, many of whom are older, right? And it's just those sliding doors are not passed through as often as they could be. Um, and then, of course, you get layers like, you know, even if even if you you are able to access a cafe or a bar or something, a lot of men spoke to me about feeling like they they would say, you know, Celeste, it's, it's so vain, but but my face. Right. Or, you know, these, these young guys, they're they're looking for a sugar daddy and I can't do that. So there's no market for me. Right. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> and then a lot of women conversely telling me that they feel quite invisible. Right. They go to the hospital. They go to a social event. Even within their family, they get um, seen as the older woman who could be the grandmother or Mrs. So and so. And one person said to me, she was like, you know, I wish I wish I was like a butch dyke because then I could enter the room and people would see me, right? Um, so, yeah, it works. It works in in many different ways there. And technology, I'm not sure. I'm very curious about that too because the kind of cohort of people I worked with and also economic class of people I was working with, people didn't have personal computers um, and weren't familiar with using them. So I'm one. I'm curious. You know, sometimes I thought I among younger people, maybe it is keeping us further away from one another, but what that could facilitate for someone who is bedridden or stuck indoors, right? If there was access to that kind of technology. So, yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Oh, like like the Paro. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And part of that was thinking long term about actually the use of artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is I recently heard in the last. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah, like a more informal. Huh. Yeah. No, no, no. No, no, this is very recent. And I want to say, I'm just 
Okay. Okay. Because, yeah. Okay. Huh. Court Perry. That's interesting because there is, I know the Ontario government, at least last time I checked, I don't know what's happening now, wanted to support the NORCs, right? Like naturally occurring retirement communities, um, like actively promote that. So. Yeah. Wouldn't allow it. Really? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that that's super interesting. And I never thought of it as a zoning. It never occurred to me that that would be a zoning issue because, because, yeah. No, I did also speak to quite a number of people who, who at some point had thought about or tried to organize a similar kind of situation. But the, the barrier I think that many people often encountered is it's such so much long term planning that you need to have a core group of people who would really commit to this this kind of project and have the financial resources for this kind of project and you know buy into it for 10 or 20 years from now um, but yeah we'll see and a lot of people also like you know early years living in communes or living in other shared living environments it's not necessarily a new thing and it's quite different from institutionalized life um, Yeah, I, I didn't take it, but I've I've gotten to know quite well some of the the people who do the education there. Oh right, sure. So um, sorry, an audience member in the room just made a comment that the five nineteen offers a course um, once a year offers um, educational opportunities for service providers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming on such a snowy day. <laughs> oh, really? Everyone online, we're looking at the ceiling right now. <laughs> All right, is there a button I should press here? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I should have brought you something. Thank you. We'll just come and.